Hello everyone. Um, as the moderator said, my name is Charlie and I will be presenting on like a snippet, so just a little bit of my dissertation work. So as I said today, I won't have time to present all of my um, findings and all of my research, but one of the things that I think is a little bit novel that I can contribute to some of the other conversations we have in this conference is the approach that I'm taking with my research. So I'm going to give like a little bit of an extended introduction to myself, to my approach, um, and to how I framed my research. Um, I will talk a little bit about my methods, just in case anyone is curious. Um, and then I will also talk about some preliminary findings and some of the like secondary goals or uh, implications I hope to take with my research. Um, so one of the things that is really important to talk about in relation to my dissertation work is that it is heavily informed um, by uh, the graduate program that I'm in. Um, so I am a PhD uh, candidate in community psychology, and I'm just going to take a moment to explain what this is because most people, um, oh, sorry, I'm looking at notes for the wrong slide. I will explain what that is in just a moment. Um, but in addition to this, my work is also heavily informed um, by my living experience. So I have about 17 years as a community organizer, as a community advocate. I started, um, you know, some of this work in high school as uh, a member of my high school's first uh, Gay Straight Alliance, um, and then now has branched off to be working with different municipal and regional governments, looking at uh, creating EDI policies. Um, I also am a community res uh, a community partner on on research teams, and I'm also the academic in a lot of community spaces. And so I bring this duality with me um, in all of the spaces I go. Um, and this is really important for me because not only has this uh, experience highlighted some of the limitations I see in current research, but it also has highlighted the vast amount of burden that sometimes happens in trans communities, especially communities like my own, that are constantly over-researched, now constantly responding to, uh, you know, grad students' calls for um, participation um, for their dissertation research, the thesis work, because uh, we have two major universities in my hometown, as well as a few colleges, major social work programs that constantly do, in my mind, very similar research. And so a lot of this has kind of shaped how I approach my research. Um, so, as I said, I just wanted to take a brief moment to talk about community uh, psychology. Um, so, community psychology is or branched off of clinical psychology, and it focuses at well-being at a community level versus an individual level. Um, so whereas, you know, clinical psychology sometimes looks at targeting well-being through like individual therapeutic interventions, uh, community psychologists would look at like what are the power structures in place that actually impact someone's well-being. Um, so looking at what are some of the factors that lead to marginalizations, lead to oppressions, and then if we can target that, then we can increase well-being for an entire community. And so kind of connected to this is this idea of transformative change. So if we can, you know, change things at the policy level or the highest level, um, then you will create long lasting transformative change for a community. And so what I have here on my screen, um, so I realize the colors may not be very visible for people in the back, um, but this is something that we call the ecological model. So it looks at people nestled within uh, institutional um, factors and then the communal factors and that the highest level um, is with the public policy. And so throughout my grad experience, um, I have been told numerous times that if you want to get to this transformative change, so the best kind of change that leads to social change, you have to look at public policy and you have to make changes at the policy level. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I sometimes unintentionally am is that smart, smart aleck that's like, so like, how do we do that? Like, how do we know this? Do we ever actually evaluate policies? And then I kind of got the, well, you know, uh, we don't, uh, we don't really engage with the policy arena. Like that's, that's not what we do. But I was 
really immersed in this idea of policy change being the pinnacle of change. And so throughout my grad work, I kind of really started to challenge this a little bit because I think as many of us know, this is not actually the, the end and all of social change. Um, so to kind of talk about my research a little bit, um, so I am doing a historical policy analysis on Canadian trans-related policies from the 1970 to 1999. This is very broad, um, but I'm specifically looking at policies um, connected to solicitation laws, so laws looking um, at governing sex work, the WPATH, and the Vital Statistics Act, which if people don't know what that is, that's the legislation that regulates uh, birth certificates, marriage certificates, identity codes, all of that good stuff. And then at the same time, I'll be doing an examination of historical records of trans activism in Canada from the same region. Um, and so I will be looking at the duality of what is happening in the policy arena, but what's also happening in the ground, the grass level within the trans community themselves. So one of the reasons why I specifically wanted to focus on policy is because I think at this point, um, as I said, coming from this community that's very overworked by the amount of calls I have to research, is that I don't think we're actually saying anything new in a lot of the research that's being generated. Um, and I don't mean this to you know, dismiss anyone else's research, but I think we have enough decades worth of research saying that trans people have barriers to healthcare, and we need to start framing this as a systemic issue. So specifically, one of the things that I hope to kind of contribute with my research is uh, to say that some of the things that we are, are experiencing are institutional, they were systemic, and they were very intentional. Um, and so, uh, so one of the things I wanted to do with my dissertation was uh, do something that would actually help explain the full parameters of the institutional barriers that we are experiencing today, um, which is to take a look at how trans policies were created on the onset. Um, and one of the ways I kind of hope, sorry, um, and one of the perspectives I hope uh, to take when I start framing my analysis is by situating the healthcare system as a colonial system and part of current colonial processes. And so the healthcare system has, be, uh, has been created and designed along with all the other government institutions. And so like, like the RCMP, like police services to, um, sorry. Um, and so because of this, the healthcare system has been utilized as a part of colonization, and this includes colonizing the genders to create this false um, binary of this, you know, gender binary. And so I think if we start collectively referring to trans experiences within this lens, I think we can start looking at our experiences within a different perspective. And so one of the things I um, specifically want to interrogate um, is this power that we give healthcare and healthcare workers. Um, and so one of the reasons why I specifically want to look at the unacknowledged and you know, untalked about power within healthcare is it, um, healthcare providers, sorry, um, is because of the work and some of the barriers I experience in my uh, community advocating work. Um, so one of the things I do within the community is I try to work with medical personnel specifically to say, like, what are some of the barriers you have in getting your peers on board? Because I'm a community member, I'm an academic, like, I got all the resources, like, let me know what you need and I will help you. Um, and, you know, and I keep hearing um, them say things that, like, you know, doctors will say, like, if I have 800 patients with heart disease and, like, five trans patients and, like, obviously I need to help those 800 patients. Um, and so what I see often is ways in which we typically advocate is to try to make sure that trans patients are just as important or should be included in those 800 patients. So to say like, well, trans people have health, uh, health problems too. So like we're included in that 800. Um, but what I don't often see is people talking about how, um, Oh, sorry, I'm getting confused in my notes. Um, but the core issue is that the government has decided that the healthcare system really only needs to like 
address 80% of the need of the healthcare needs in Canada, right? Um, and so, um, which means that the government has made the decision to dismiss and uh, ignore and withhold care to 80% of the need, right? And this is why it becomes like, well, if I have 800 patients versus 500 patients, sorry, five patients, and like, obviously I need to like prioritize everyone. And that means that they actually are not mandated to help all of the patients and nor do they have the resources to help all of the patients. And that is a thing that we need to start interrogating. Um, because within the system, the healthcare providers are essentially told that they have to withhold care to some patients and the ways in which they make decisions on who to withhold care to are rooted in this normative patriarchal white supremacy colonial all of those good things that we're here to fight against um, all of those reasons um, and this is further complicated by the fact that you know uh, psychiatrists um, and all of those people uh, were granted the power to define legally what a transsexual was, who was categorized as a transsexual and how to treat them. So again, at no point has the system actually been really designed to provide care to trans people in the way that we have wanted and needed to. Um, and another distressing fact that has come up in some of the research I have done is that there isn't any infrastructure or mechanisms of accountability to ensure that doctors actually provide care and to provide good care. Um, and so one of my um, studies that I did before, I did focus groups with um, six trans, <coughs> excuse me, six trans students, and we were asking them about their experiences of healthcare. And one of the things that kept coming up was they kept talking about how futile they felt having these conversations. Because even when they launched formal complaints, wanted to launch human rights complaints against their doctors, you know, brought up all of these things of like, excuse me, you're being transphobic, like this is not okay. A lot of the times they were told like, well, the only thing we can really do is to ask doctors to take diversity training like there's nothing else we can really do, but like, thank you for letting us know. Um, and so throughout the study, the participants talked about how they felt extremely exhausted. They were triggered. They didn't learn anything new about participating in the study, but they still hoped that like by doing this all the time, that eventually something good would happen. And so this is one of the projects I worked on right before I started my dissertation, like right before the pandemic hit. And I was like, man, this, this idea of like overburdening a community like really resonated with me. And so even though I'm in psychology and we typically have participants within our research, I was like, I can't, I can't do this. I need to figure out a different way to do my study. And so this is why I wanted to specifically look at policy to figure out what are the reasons that we actually have this experience. Like why, why is it that we know doctors are not mandated to treat us? They're not mandated to actually learn about any trans uh, healthcare within like medical schools. We can't tell university instructors to actually teach medical students about trans healthcare. Like, why why is this how things are um and so i wanted to do a policy analysis to figure out like what are some of these things um so i'm just going to kind of talk about some of my methods and findings now and so some of the research questions that i had was I wanted to provide a critical examination of policies that have either disproportionately impacted trans communities or created as a solution to a trans problem. And so this critical policy analysis will include an examination of how trans people were problematized throughout the process of when certain legislations or certain uh, policies became um, implemented. And I also wanted to provide a historical analysis of trans activism, specifically how examining how trans communities have advocated for or against policies. Um, and this is something that I was really critical to research like this, because oftentimes when we talk about policy change, we completely ignore that trans people have been at the forefront of making sure those policies actually happened. And the ma many times we're seen as passive participants 
Um, and I also wanted to gain insights into this relationship between policy and advocacy um, and to demonstrate how a deeper understanding of these two processes can have implications for further policy changes. And so my ultimate goal with this is to be looking at next steps, not necessarily just looking at what has happened, but like how can we take what we have learned and move it um, into hopefully more policy changes or more social changes in the future. Um, so there are two main sources of data that I will be drawing upon. Um, and this is looking at like what I see as the archival records and then what I see as the policy documents. Um, so the archival records, most of this uh, data I have collected. So I'm looking at transgender uh, archives here at Victoria. So in the fall, I spent 12 days here going through all the archives, um, some digital trans archives, two spirit archives, looking at the archives that I can. Um, and then for the policy documents, this one is ongoing. This is the part that has been the most challenging, which I wasn't anticipating, um, but looking at different legal databases, government archives. Um, I'm not going to really go into specifics, but if anyone is curious where this stuff can be found, I am more than happy to let you know later on. And so there are a few preliminary uh, findings I want to go through. Many of them will not be revolutionary or ones that like people will surprise a lot of people. But again, from psychology, this is something that's often not really talked about. One of the things that I found most interesting is that Canada has had limited trans related surgeries because many people were traveling to the US. And so there, were, in my mind, is a long history of the Canadian healthcare system just bouncing people around and shoving them off into other places. And Canada was doing this uh, with trans patients as well. And so this is uh, why I think personally we're about a century behind in providing trans related care because we never had to for the longest time. Um, there were large international networks that were created to keep each other informed. So some of the advocacy work that I am doing right now is the exact same as what has been happening in the 50s and 60s. Um, so that was disheartening, but also kind of validating to be like, yes, this is, this is the proper way to do trans advocacy. Um, one of the things that I was not anticipating was the fact that a lot of the things that were happening in the 70s and 80s were a result of Trudeau's 1969 omnibus bill. Omnibus bill. Um, and so for those who don't know or, you know, who are not Canadian, um, the 1969 omnibus bill, so I can't say that, um, was seen as the start of the gay rights movement in Canada. So Trudeau Sr. or Pierre Trudeau said, there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation. And so this is seen as like him recognizing that homosexuality needed to be uh, decriminalized. Um, this is actually not what happened at all. And so what Trudeau ended up saying was, you know, there is no place in the bedrooms of the nation. Um, but that was just recognizing that the police couldn't um, didn't have any jurisdiction in those areas. And so what it ended up doing is essentially taunting the police by saying, you can't stop these queers from doing what they want to do, while at the same time, I think giving hope to a lot of queer trans folks that they had now been recognized and validated by law, so they started to become more visible. And so what you actually see um, when you look at historical records is a huge spike in queer phobic violence in the 70s, and that's because of this bill. And so this was not something I was intentionally going to look at, but this ended up being um, the start of a lot of transphobic violence and homophobic violence that we saw starting in the 70s. Um, so the last thing I kind of want to end on is looking at um, how many of these archives are very white. Um, and there's two reasons for this. Um, one is that when we look at the time period, racialized communities were um, obviously dealing with very significant other forms of violence. Um, and the other reason is that a lot of the ways in which we advocated was steeped in this middle class respectability. So as I kind of said, like a lot of the times in which we try to advocate is that we try to make sure our community is part of that 80% that should get care. And so this has left out a lot of people over the years. Um, and so what I 
am hoping to kind of highlight with some of my research is to prove is that we need to look at the system and make sure the system can accommodate 100% of the care that we need rather than just fighting who gets included in that 80%. Um, and the other thing is that archival work is emotionally exhausting. And so when I was uh, talking with my supervisor about you know, some of my research, I received pushback for about two years about not doing interviews. Um, and I was like, I don't want to burden my community. Um, and it seems that a lot of that has shifted to just being burdened on me. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure that this is not new for the many people in the room. Um, but it is something that I wasn't anticipating. I was not anticipating to be harmed so much by realizing that there was a whole Canadian trans history that I had just never heard about. Um, and so this is something I hope to highlight um, with my research as well. Um, I do have one other slide, but I know I'm out of time. Um, so if the, okay, awesome. Um, so I don't know if people in the back can see this, but this is a button I found that says theory mutilates, surgery liberates. Um, this is something I found significant. It's not really related to the context on the slide though. Um, so some of my dissertation has been born out of this anger that psychology especially, um, but also related fields continue to pump articles about primary studies um, that don't actually build on each other and don't create that like momentum we need to like take down the system or to address the system. Which has led to uh, a lot of burden and burnout within trans communities. Um, and so for my dissertation research, I wanted to provide a roadmap to other psychologists and psychology research and how this can be done without participants, how we can look at what people have already been said. So as we have listened throughout the conference, like people have been telling the story for decades. And I think we as researchers need to put in just a little bit of effort to find those stories without reintroducing, sorry, reintroducing, what's the word phrase, Re reinventing the wheel every single time, and so we don't continue to overburden the communities into the way that we have. Okay, I think that's my last slide. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Adrian McCrory. My pronouns are he, him. <clears throat> um, so I recently completed my PhD uh, at the Australian Catholic University. And I'd like to talk to you, I guess, all today, just about some elements that came out of my research, which was overall on Australian uh, trans and gender diverse experiences in the criminal legal system um, across the 20th century. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from where I'm speaking. Um, so I'm on the stolen lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the ongoing strength and resilience, especially of trans and gender diverse people within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, so this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I'd also like to give just a quick note um, about the content of this presentation. Um, as I'm talking about historical experiences of trans people in the criminal legal system, um, naturally I will be sort of discussing instances of uh, transphobia, homophobia, institutional and systemic violence and discrimination. Um, I don't really go into anything too explicit, um, but you know, do feel free to step out at any time or anything that you need to do, as I understand that these histories can be sometimes quite difficult to listen to. Um, so yes, uh, in this paper, I'm just going to be talking in quite broad strokes um, about the experiences of trans and gender diverse people um, in Australian prisons, uh, in Australian prisons from around the 1950s and 60s through to the present day. Um, there'll of course be a lot of detail that I'm brushing over, um, but sort of the key question that I want to sort of look at and examine is what can these histories tell us about how the prison system deals with gender diversity and what are the many significant limitations of understanding gender diversity within sort of, you know, sex segregated castle institutions and environments. Um, so going back uh, to sort of the 50s and 60s, the first real information that we have on uh, systemic housing for trans and gender diverse people in Australia uh, relates to Cooma Jail in New South Wales. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the history of Cooma Jail itself, um, but if you are interested, I strongly recommend uh, The Greatest Menace podcast by Patrick Upwood and Simon Kunick. 
Um, in short, Cooma Jail was established in the 1950s as a prison specifically designated for housing prisoners convicted of homosexual offences, uh, or they termed homosexual offences. Um, so it's unclear exactly when it stopped operating as this kind of homosexual prison, as they called it. Um, but it was in operation at, as such, at least throughout the 1960s and into the 70s. Um, and the prison was concerned with studying homosexuality and experimenting with different types of treatment um, on prisoners. Um, it's unclear exactly what took place there, as records are quite um, difficult to get a hold of. Um, oh, sorry, I've got an alarm going up. Um, but Kuma seems to be the only prison in the world, um, or at least the only one that we know of, that was specifically designed um, to isolate and house uh, gay prisoners. So while the prison was not uh, explicitly designed to house trans and gender diverse prisoners, um, due to sort of the conflation between male homosexuality and gender nonconformity, it appears that there was at least a small but notable population of trans women housed at Kuma Jail. Um, so The Greatest Menace podcast, uh, for example, features an interview with a trans woman named Jackie who was incarcerated at Kuma during this period. Um, and Jackie described being housed with quite a few other trans women and what she called drag queens. Um, similarly, in my research, I found a, some articles in sort of a 1966 Melbourne Truth article about a 20-year-old um, who described their account of working as a sort of drag queen or a female impersonator in Sydney um, and their time in Kuma Jail. Um, so this person had numerous encounters with police um, while, uh, while presenting as female. Um, before ultimately being sent to Kuma Jail for four months. So the article uh, described their experiences of arriving at the prison, um, stating, and I'm just going to quote it here, there was a riot where they took me to jail. I was still in female clothing, and when they got me to change, they asked me to remove my black wig. They wouldn't believe it was my own hair. The first day I started wa uh, walking in the line, the other prisoners whistled and the warder pulled me up and told me to walk like a man or else. So what's interesting about Kuma, sort of from my perspective, um, is how it demonstrates an attempt at prison segregation based along an additional access from the typical sort of binary male-female split that we usually see in prisons. So introducing this new element of separating heterosexual and homosexual offenders um, seemingly created a host of challenges for those who ran the prison. Um, but we can see from the inclusion of transgender women um, that this sort of prison experiment also ran up against um, a problem that prisons still seem to be grappling with today of where do you house trans and gender diverse people within a sort of fundamentally arbitrary and binarist system. Um, so jumping forward a little bit in time, um, the 1980s in Australia saw some very interesting movement for trans and gender diverse people uh, within the context of prisons. Um, the landmark case of Harrison McGuinness was a notable legal turning point um, for determining, tra determining transgender people's legal status, and by extension, in theory, if not in practice, uh, where they ought to be housed in prisons. Um, so to briefly summarise, Harris and McGuinness were both charged under the New South Wales Crimes Act for procuring a male person to commit an act of indecency. Um, Harris was a transgender woman who had undergone gender affirmation surgeries, um, McGuinness was a transgender woman who had not undergone gender affirmation surgeries. Um, and the question at the heart of their case was whether Harris and McGuinness were each legally male or female, um, as the Crimes Act made it illegal for males but not for females to procure sexual acts with men. Um, the original ruling in 1982 concluded that they were both legally male, um, the magistrate stating that uh, there were only two categories of sex. Um, so the judge said that there was uh, that it was clear that both defendants were persons with male bodies who live as females, and he ruled that gender in a legal sense should be indicated by chromosomes, uh, gonads, and genitals, meaning that gender affirmation surgeries would not be considered as a basis for a legal change in sex. Um, but in 1984, Harris and McGuinness's solicitor appealed the ruling um, and sort of stated that no Australian parliament had actually determined the outcome to the issue, uh, and it was up to the court to make a decision. Um, trans rights and sex work activist Roberta Perkins gave evidence at the appeal, and she stated that in several instances, um, Harris had been previously sent to jail for misdemeanors um, and had always been admitted to the Mulawar Women's Detention Centre, showing that 
uh, in practice, the system was recognizing her as a woman, at least in some instances. Um, so the final ruling by the Supreme Court of New South Wales uh, was not reached until 1988, um, but the ultimate verdict was that Harris was legally female on the basis that she had undergone full sexual reassignment surgery. Um, and because, because McGuinness had not had uh, these surgeries, she, by contrast, was not um, judged to be legally female. Um, so, sorry, I'll just have a quick drink. At the beginning of the 1980s, um, there was some debate over whether the New South Wales Corrective Services um, should establish a jail specifically for transgender prisoners, somewhat reminiscent of um, Kuma jail in, in previous decades. Um, and they sort of said that it was difficult sometimes to determine whether a prisoner should be in a jail for male or males or females. Um, so this facility was never built or implemented. Um, in practice, trans and gender diverse people were simply placed ad hoc in prisons based on a range of factors, um, mostly tied to sort of perceived gender presentation. Once incarcerated, um, trans prisoners were at the time at times the center of political scandal. One particular example of this was uh, the discourses around transgender women. Um, inside Long Bay Jail in New South Wales, where according to reporting uh, um, around 1980, um, about 20 trans prisoners at the jail were being provided with French type female underwear and makeup in, a reduced, reduced, in an effort to reduce tensions within the prison. Um, the prison administration had also allegedly um, paid for female impersonators to go to the jail to instruct prisoners in dress and makeup. Um, it's unclear from the reporting how much truth there was to these allegations overall, um, but they do demonstrate an anxiety which was present in society at the time regarding how gender diverse prisoners were to be treated. So was their gender identity a factor in their crime? Was it dangerous or offensive to provide accommodations for their gender expression? Um, and could prisons, them prisons themselves be sort of complicit in encouraging gender diversity um, or sort of you know, deviant sexual behaviour as they might have considered it. Um, skipping ahead again, the 1990s and the 2000s um, saw much more concentrated efforts to legislate for trans and gender diverse prison considerations, um, as opposed to sort of the ad hoc challenges of prior decades. Um, throughout the 1990s and the 2000s, state and territory prisons um, developed and implemented policies for housing trans and gender diverse prisoners. Um, these policies typically advised against placing transgender men in male prisons out of concern for the safe, their safety from fellow inmates. Um, so in some cases, this meant housing them in female prisons. Um, it other, in other cases, it meant isolating them from other prisoners entirely. Um, meanwhile, transgender women were more likely to be housed in male prisons um, out of this concern for the perceived safety of other cis women prisoners. Um, so transgender women, as we all know, were and are consistently characterised in sort of transphobic discourses as um, men who are invading women's spaces and things like that um, with the goal of, you know, assaulting cisgender women or, or things like that. Um, and worth noting here as well that research has shown uh, that not only are transgender women, of course, highly unlikely to assault cisgender women in sex segregated spaces, but are themselves more likely to be the victim of assault and harassment in these spaces. Um, so awareness of transgender existence heightened during these decades um, and many legislative and legal institutions raced to catch up um, with the issues that trans and gender diverse people themselves had already been discussing in their own communities. Many of these debates focused on the question of when uh, someone could or should be considered to be transgender um, and more broadly what gender was. So these debates would focus around was gender a fixed biological category, which could only be changed via surgery and perhaps not even then, or was it a social category based on identification and lived experience? Um, there's a lot of nuanced discussion around, you know, all of these questions around the nature of gender, gender categorization. Um, but when it comes to legislation and policy, especially in relation to, for instance, prison housing, Nuanced approaches to these discussions created significant challenges. So there's little room for nuance when deciding where to house someone in a binary sex segregated prison system. Um, and the alternative possibilities, such as solitary uh, accommodation, often pre um, presented significant challenges to a prisoner's well-being and human rights. <laughs> 
So the 2010s and the 2020s so far um, have seen a raft of amendments around Australia to prior policies um, from the 1990s and the 2000s. Um, and these amendments are typically designed to broaden the categories of who might be considered trans or gender diverse. Um, so, for example, removing requirements for surgery or for hormones. Um, discourses are ongoing around the placement of transgender prisoners in line with international fear mongering about trans women primarily as dangerous offenders. So an example of this would be August 19, 2022, for example, the Australian Herald Sun newspaper published an article which stated that inmates at the Dame Phyllis Frost Correctional Centre, um, a woman's prison in Victoria, Australia, were having their safety threatened by the presence of a trans woman in the prison who had a history of sexual assault against women and children. Um, so arguments against her presence in the prison included that she was not on HRT and that she had a, quote, working penis. So the article stated that Corrections Victoria must ban trans prisoners from women's jails and prioritise the safety of female inmates instead of trying to appease the trans lobby. So despite policy changes around Australia, trans and gender diverse prisoners are still being housed on more or less an ad hoc basis um, and, more, and most often simply on their sex assigned at birth. Whether this is for the safety of transgender people themselves, as they claim, or for the perceived safety of other prisoners, um, or simply for the convenience of prisons, this exposes a contradiction between the state's legal recognition of trans and gender diverse people and the state's practices of policing and incarceration. More than this, however, um, it forces us to question what the criminal legal system is doing when it divides spaces along binary sex lines. So the rationale given is one of protection. Female prisoners must be housed separately from male prisoners for their protection. Trans men must be housed separately from cisgender men for their protection. Transgender women must be housed separately from cisgender women for the protection of cisgender women. And trans women must be also be housed separately from cisgender men for the protection of trans women, leaving trans women with isolation as one of few viable options. Non-binary people especially cannot be situated clearly within this framework. Um, and any attempts to house non-binary people either fall back on solitary isolation um, or classification along rigid binary gender lines. Um, so just to, wrap, just to wrap up, um, the reality is <clears throat> um, that this endless cycle of sort of classification and reclassification of bodies, gender, sexuality, from attempts to segregate gay men at Kuma Jail to picking apart the chromosomes, hormones and genitals of individuals and rulings um, around the legal status of trans people to ongoing discourses over placement in prisons. This is all fundamentally opposed to the reality of trans and gender diverse experience. Um, so there's no policy which can be implemented which will account for all trans people's experiences to place them sort of correctly inside these institutions. Um, rather, it's the institutions which need to um, re-examine and change how they operate. Um, classification and scrutiny of gendered bodies does not only harm transgender people, um, it also has the potential to harm anyone um, who does not fit neatly into embodied gender and social norms. Um, so, yeah, that's um, kind of all for me right now. But, yeah, I'll be really keen to discuss everything further when we have a bit of time for questions. Thank you.